Robots That Wave at Amoebas. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Mark Miskin, Assistant Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science. Welcome, Dr. Miskin. Give us a brief summary of your professional background, especially as it relates to robotics. <laughs> So it's a, it's a funny question. Um, I'm actually, I'm a physicist by training, um, weirdly enough. So um, I kind of found my way into robotics. Um, so I started, uh, I, I mean, I'm a, entirely a physicist. My, my undergraduate degree was in physics. Um, my PhD was in physics. And my postdoc was actually also in physics. Um, but uh, yeah, and it was an interesting career path. So, so I tell undergrads this all the time when they come here. I, I actually started doing dark math when I was a, a, like a sophomore. And then I sort of moved through things. Um, eventually what I found out is I, I really like building things. Um, and I like really like building things that are small. And in the physics world, right, there's this place for people like that. It's the, the, nanos, the nanospace. Um, and uh, uh, I fell in love with it. So it took me a long time to find out that that's what I wanted to do. That was in my, my postdoc, basically. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, that was sort of my, my professional preparation. And, and truth be told, right, I, I'm mostly a, a nano person, um, but uh, increasingly these days, I, I find myself in robotics. So <laughs> um, I, it's, sorry, but, but that's, that's the truth, right? Is, um, yeah, but I think if you want the real details, right? So my undergraduate was a, a, a bachelor's from RPI in physics, and then my, uh, my PhD was at the University of Chicago, um, where again, I studied condensed matter physics. What is cell scale robotics and how small do robots get and what functions can they perform? Those are really good questions. So um, for cell scale robotics, uh, what we mean are robots that are about 10 to 100 microns in size. Uh, so to put that in context, um, there's, there's two points of context we like. One is about the width of a hair is about 100 microns. Um, and that's also about the smallest thing that you can see by eye. So if something is just under about 100 microns, it's invisible to you effectively, you, you can't make it out. Um, and, and that's the size that we're interested in, is sort of right in that ballpark between one to, a, one to 100 microns, 10 kind of being the sweet spot, um, which is roughly speaking the size of, of cells. Um, if you go and you get some pond water and you gather it up, uh, a big paramecium will be about 100 microns, a uh, red blood cell will be about eight microns. How are these robots made? Ah, so, so we get asked this question a lot, right? It's one of the, um, it's probably the best question, right? It's the thing I love the most about my job is actually building this stuff. Um, the, the answer is, you know, we have built over the last 50 years of miniaturizing microelectronics, one of the most powerful and impressive technologies for making tiny stuff ever. Um, and essentially what my group does is we hijack that technology that we developed for the microelectronics industry. Um, we just use it for something else. We use it for building small scale robots. Um, it sounds really small, right, like 10 to 100 microns, but it's important to remember, like, if in my, the microelectronics world, that's huge. So uh, if you were to build something with state-of-the-art, um, you know, lithography or, or your favorite processing technique for making tiny parts, um, the current state-of-the-art is you can build uh, features that are about three to five nanometers on a sign. Um, which means that you can fit something like a million transistors in the space of a paramecium, right? It's staggering, right? So, so basically, <laughs> the tools we've developed for building these tiny things are, are unbelievable. And you, you, can, you can already access that size scale, which is really pretty cool. Okay. You've established how small they are. but how, So how do you power a robot this small? I mean, how do you, how do you make them move? And how do you make them wave at amoebas? <laughs> Yeah, so um, power is tricky, right? Uh, you, can't, you can't just buy parts off the shelf and, and put them together. Um, we tend to have to think about two things. Uh, one is how do you build things that, that work for power that work well when they're small? Um, so as you make things tinier and tinier, you know, the rules of the game kind of change as you get down in, into really microscopic dimensions. Uh, one of the things that works really well are solar cells. Um, and uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> the reason it's actually really simple is a solar cell, uh, the amount of energy you get is proportional to its area. So if you have a really big area, you get more energy. A really small area, you get less energy. Um, whereas for a battery, right, it's proportional to its volume. So it goes as the cube of the length, whereas the solar cell goes as the square of the length. Now, if you take a number and you square it and it's a small number, that's going to be bigger than if you cube it. Um, and it, consequence of that scaling means that, that uh, things like solar cells tend to work actually really well. Um, so literally what we do is we build little tiny solar cells and then we can shoot light at the robots to supply them with energy. 
So I want to go a little deep here. Uh, how does an algorithm convert material properties into executable instructions for, for robot elements? <laughs> so that's, uh, we don't quite do that yet. So, so that's part of my PhD work. Um, that's something my lab is going to do in the future. So uh, one of the things that I was really, I've been really interested in for a long time is about constructing computer algorithms that can basically solve physics problems. Um, and what we realized we could do with the tiny robots was start to use them as though they were material. Um, the catch becomes if you have, you know, a million robots and you can really tell each of them what to do, how do you parse that space? There's so many possibilities. Uh, so one of the things we're exploring is, is building algorithms that can, can do that problem for us, that they can figure out what instructions they need to give to which robots so that when they perform their, their tasks, you get some feature that you want back out. Um, well, I, I'm sure that your work has actually been compared to the 1966 movie, Fantastic Voyage, but your nanobots really can be injected through a syringe, right? I mean, what problems do you envision solving with cell-sized machines? So, so two points. So um, you're correct. Everyone has compared us to Fantastic Voyage. In fact, I actually watched Fantastic Voyage to see how big the submarine was relative to the robots. They're actually about the same size. So, so it's not a bad comparison. We, we actually are, you know, roughly speaking, because you, you can work it out. Um, they never actually say how big it is, but you can work it out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, and, and likewise, right, that becomes, once you know that, it's, it's very hard not to imagine that as a natural application, right? And it makes sense. You, you know, if you've got a robot that's the size of the cell, um, you want to put it in environments where talking to cells or working with cells is useful. Um, and so we're better than the body, right? That's, that's the most important cells that we have are, are, are our own. Um, one of the vision applications has been uh, things where it really matters that which cell you're talking to or what you're doing, right? So uh, a really powerful aspect of having these tiny machines is that um, you can really start to interact with biology on its own terms. Uh, we think our really useful applications there are gonna be interfacing with things in, in like the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. Um, if you think about, say, like a nerve that's connecting your brain to your hand, uh, that genuinely is one cell. Um, it's a meter long, but it's 10 microns in diameter. And if that gets injured, right, you desperately want something that's able to take, say, that signal and relay it to the other part of, of your, your finger. Um, that means you need things that can go into little tiny environments, connect to specific parts, communicate data back and forth. Um, and that's something we're actually exploring is, are, are areas like that for um, an application of robotics. How do you get them out once they've been injected? It depends on the application. So um, for the things we're kind of looking at now, we don't want to. So we view it as kind of like a pacemaker um, where, you know, you're really trying to do something long-term that the, the robot is going to stay in there, you know, basically indefinitely. Um, for other tasks where we don't want to do that, uh, we've been looking into like um, surgical strategies for removal. So uh, you basically would have something where, you can kind of, you know, collect the robots to a place and then take them back out. Um, we've also, you know, there's other groups that study this too. And one of the other big trends is uh, making things biodegradable. So literally building the robot, it's that it performs a task and just disintegrates um, without any, any harm to the body. So what's the next big breakthrough you anticipate having? Sure. So um, I, you know, we, we kind of, we have a five-year plan. Uh, so <laughs> so the, the, the big thing that we really want to do in the next, let's say, five years um, is really incorporating high-level electronics into our robots. So the stuff we build now, um, we have very simple pieces of electronics in them. We have mechanisms for sending them power through these tiny solar cells. We have really basic control circuits on it. Uh, but what we really want is programmability. Uh, we want things, and, and that's kind of one of the distinguishing features of, like, robots, like really powerful robots, right? It's a system where you can send an information and it stores that information and then carries out the task that you've asked it to do. Um, so that's one of our, 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 our major breakthroughs that I think is on the near horizon, that, that right now where we're at is we have circuits playing nice with, with machines at the size scale. Uh, what we really want to go is from circuits to computers. So things where you give it instructions and then it executes a program and, and off it goes doing that task. Dr. Mark. What's that? <laughs> no one knows how to do that yet. <laughs> well, thanks for working on it. Dr. Mark Miskin, Assistant Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Science. If somebody wants to connect with you, Mark, maybe they want to find out more about this work. How can they do that? 
uh, they're welcome to visit our website uh, where we always post our, our most recent publications, videos, um, and uh, also contact information for both me and my graduate students. All right, thanks again. And find my, more of my interviews right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.